Just to repeat, it's uh, seven o'clock. This is Sale Martha's Vineyard and uh, the Zoom presentation by Weather Routing Inc. will begin shortly. Um, I will rattle on here for a few more minutes. Um, thanks to Alex Avalos, is that correct? <laughs> yeah, I've forgotten already. But, Avalos. <laughs> Avalos, uh, there we go. Uh, Alex Avalos uh, for coming and joining us from Weather Routing Inc. And um, he will be presenting a uh, talk about storm surge and coastal flooding in a few minutes. Um, if you haven't uh, already uh, done so, uh, check out the Sale Martha's Vineyard website for some recordings of previous um, events. And uh, we will have a recording of this event up there after it is over. Um, Couple of sale MV notes. Uh, Signups for summer programs have begun and are going very rapidly. So please get your uh, summer signups in, especially if you are you have youths that will be in our beginner programs, uh, messing around in boats and minnows. Those are filling up fast. So uh, sign up for summer, and uh, of course. Don't forget that we have coming this summer our two fantastic big events uh, on Sail Martha's Vineyard. We have the Vineyard Cup and of course the Seafood Buffet and Auction. Seafood Buffet and Auction is July 6th. Uh, that's 2023, right across the road here on Tisbury Wharf and Vineyard Haven. And uh, the Vineyard Cup will be the following weekend uh, Friday, September, or excuse me, July 7th through the 9th. Um, more information, of course, is on our website under events. And um, we've got a few, few people here have joined us, Alex. So I'm gonna let you start talking about storm surge and coastal flooding. And again, thanks to Weather Routing Inc. for presenting this show. They are our weather sponsors for the Vineyard Cup in the summer, and they provide uh, very uh, detailed custom weather reports uh, throughout the event. Very useful for the competitors and um, as well as CLMV. Thanks again. My pleasure, John. And, and uh, again, thank you so much for having me tonight. And I look forward to having this discussion uh, with you and the participants in the, in the, dis in the lecture. Um, so now we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, my name is Alex Avalos. Uh, I am an assistant operations manager here at Weather Routing. Um, tonight's discussion, as John had mentioned, is going to be in regards to coastal flooding and storm surge, surge uh, which is a continuation from last year's uh, lecture uh, when Brian presented about nor'easters. Um, so a little bit of a background about our company. Um, we've been in business for about 60 years. Um, originally, our business started in New York City, and over the years, we've worked our way up the Hudson River, now find ourselves in Glens Falls, uh, which is about an hour north of Albany. Um, we specialize in forecasts that are customized to vessel-specific needs. Not only do we provide them the forecasts for the best weather window to get from point A to point B, we also work closely with them to provide the best route to get them from point A to point B with a given departure. Um, you will get clients that will ask about um, the feasibility of a transit at any given time of year, um, you know, six to 12 months down the road, for example. Um, those are what we call climatology studies. Um, that is one of the more specialized reports that we offer. Um, we are a growing uh, company. We have over 50 meteorologists on staff, um, and we've grown especially over the past five to six years. Um, we have two divisions. I'm an assistant operations manager in our yacht division. Um, the yacht division division provides forecasts for motor yachts, sailing boats and yachts, sport fishers. Um, our commercial division uh, provides forecasts for cruise ships, as well as commercial vessels and commercial marinas. Um, we also do forecasts for races and regattas. Uh, we do forecasts for rallies. Um, we do forecasts for yacht marinas as well. Um, so we have a big tent when it comes to forecasting for various areas of the marine industry, um, whether it's the boats or the vessels or the marinas themselves. And what where we stand out from our competitors is that we provide um, these forecasts on a customized basis for what they need. 
So now that you've learned a little bit more about weather routing itself, um, we're going to get into the, the core of the discussion for tonight, uh, which is coastal flooding. Um, and there are several factors which can affect that. Um, we're going to go over two of the more common features um, that cause coastal floodings. Um, and those are include nor'easters and tropical cyclones um, are the two biggest ones. But we're also going to go over two other ones, um, such as storm surge and tidal phases. Um, storm surge is definitely the result of the former two um, weather phenomena that occur. Um, we're also going to go over forecasting tools uh, closer to the end of the discussion here. Um, so what is coastal flooding? Um, well, it's generically known as one of those situations where um, you get excessive heavy rainfall and, and over a very short period of time, and that causes um, you know, flooding in, in localized regions. Um, you may have uh, rivers also cresting over flood stage that can result from heavy rainfall. But as it pertains to the coast, um, usually what happens is you have an inundation of seawater that moves across coastal regions. Um, and this is the result of wind pushing water on shore um, that can cause um, coastal flooding concerns. Um, and it can also occur in areas where you have um, protective measures in place, such as uh, breaches or um, protective barriers or levees. Um, when water breaches over those um, protective barriers, you can get coastal flooding in those situations. Um, so what is a nor'easter? Um, well, it's a system, it's a type of system that develops primarily between uh, the mid-Atlantic uh, and the state of Georgia, um, but it can develop as far north as New England. Um, and the reason why they're called nor'easters is because the dominant wind direction comes out of the northeast. Um, and one thing that uh, is very common with them is they, with the northeasterly wind, you do get uh, cold air that propagates towards New England and the northeastern states. When you get that cold air in place, one of the common weather phenomena that happens with nor'easters is snow. Uh, but they can also produce several other types of um, weather with them as well, um, in, including wind. Um, you know, snow is more common on the north side of these systems when you're, you're, um, you're, you're considering that colder air overhead um, advecting from Canada. Um, but also on the south side of these systems, you can get um, a warmer air mass in place that can cause heavy rain in those locations and even flooding. And that's not, not including storm surge um, itself. Um, flooding can occur from excessive heavy rainfall um, in these locations. Um, nor'easters are also known for strengthening and intensifying within cold air um, that's evidenced uh, by uh, the northeasterly wind that's in place with these systems. And you can see in this example, um, they do have a distinct comma-shaped feature. Um, you know, that's basically what you've got here is you've got a front that's extending uh, towards the Bahamas in this example um, as the system continues to jet northeastward um, towards the Canadian Maritimes. Um, so what drives uh, the movement of nor'easters? Well, one of the biggest uh, mechanisms is the jet stream, uh, which acts as a transportation device for a lot of these uh, systems that move across the country, um, that moves these disturbances, which eventually strengthen into storms. You get the strong northeasterly winds from Canada, as I said, um, that feed into uh, the system as the system moves along the jet stream and towards the Canadian Maritimes. And one of the things that you have to consider with the jet stream too, is that you do get areas of vertical motion, uh, which generally occur within the trough um, behind the downstream ridge. Um, as a brief refresher on what troughs and ridges are, um, troughs are associated with inclement weather, uh, whereas ridges, as you can see in this example over the Rockies and in the Pacific West, those are associated with fair weather. Uh, when you get vertical motion, you get uh, rise to low pressure systems and in inclement weather that develops. When you get sinking motion, you get areas of high pressure or fair and benign weather. One of the other mechanisms that drives nor'easter development and intensification is the Gulf Stream. Uh, which is a thin ribbon of warm sea surface temperatures that propagate northeastward along the southeastern U.S. coast. Um, and then they fan out into open waters across the central and western Atlantic. Um, why is that important, you might ask? Well, what happens when you have cold um, sea surface temperatures meeting with warm sea surface temperatures to the south, it creates instability. Um, and when you have sharp temperature gradients such as this, the instability can be locally enhanced. And when you have that enhanced instability, 
that it's that in itself, in addition to cold northeasterly winds uh, funneling into the system, can really further intensify uh, these features. And when the jet stream picks up the system, it accelerates it northeastward um, towards Nova Scotia, the Canadian Maritimes, and um, you know definitely the northeasterly winds are a primary focus for what causes northeast nor'easters to strengthen. But um, it's certainly influenced and enhanced by the presence of the Gulf Stream um, to the south, which basically um, is most persistent from Cape Hatteras down along eastern Florida. Moving on from nor'easters, um, tropical cyclones are another common cause for concern with coastal flooding. Um, unlike nor'easters, which largely feed off of cold air temperatures um, and even cold sea surface temperatures for their, for their uh, strengthening, tropical cyclones, it's quite the opposite. Um, these systems tend to form in latitudes between five degrees north and 30 degrees north, uh, basically within the tropics, as their name implies. Um, and their strengthening mechanisms occur when they are feeding and tapping into uh, these warmer air and sea surface temperatures. As far as the classification for a tropical cyclone, um, if the winds are less than 39 miles per hour, it, it's classified as a tropical depression. If it's in excess of 39 miles per hour, but less than 73 miles per hour, it's what we know as a tropical storm. But if it increases to above 74 miles per hour, that's what we would call a hurricane. And you can see the structure of, the, of a hurricane involves an eye wall and spiraling rain bands. Um, and in this example, you can see there's storm surge along a hypothetical coastline because these systems have a cyclonic or counterclockwise rotation, you're gonna have the counterclockwise rotation of the winds propagating towards the coast, which would then enhance the storm surge. Unfortunately, there is a, uh, a toll that comes with uh, tropical cyclones and particularly hurricanes. Um, significant, significant loss of life can occur with these systems, especially in areas that are more vulnerable to coastal flooding. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly billions of dollars in damages can result from, from tropical cyclones um, and strong to major hurricanes, as we unfortunately saw with Hurricane Ian back at the end of September. And in this example, you can see Hurricane Katrina's uh, barreling down on uh, southeastern Louisiana and New Orleans. Now, um, the Atlantic hurricane season runs from June 1st through November 30th. Um, and, you know, tropical development has been known to occur in May and is actually incurring more frequent, occurring more frequently during the month of May, um, particularly areas across the eastern Gulf of Mexico, the northwestern Caribbean, over to the Florida Peninsula are more at risk in May and June. Um, but the most active month for tropical development occurs in September and October uh, when the Leeward Island or the um, Cape Verde Island season begins heading into the later summer and early fall. September 10th is the peak date of the Atlantic hurricane season. And then we begin to slowly see the season will begin to quiet down. Um, but that should be thrown in with the caveat that October is still a, a statistically pretty active month as well. Um, the downturn in the Atlantic hurricane season is most notable from November onward through the end of that month um, when the season ends on November 30th. So it's definitely good for those who live in uh, hurricane prone areas to be well aware of the tropics uh, leading up through the end of November as these systems still do occur um, well into October and into November. So what drives tropical cyclone development? Um, as, I as I referred to earlier, their um, northeastern U.S. counterparts, nor'easters, feed off of cold um, sea surface temperatures and air temperatures, um, but tropical cyclones require sea surface temperatures that are in excess of 80 degrees Fahrenheit. One of the other features that they need um, working in their favor is light winds aloft. And what happens is um, basically one of the uh, metrics that we look at is wind shear, which is an indicator of winds changing with height. Um, so basically in most instances, winds would be lightest at the surface, strongest aloft, um, that would indicate, uh, wind shear being present. Um, you ultimately want light winds to be present up and down the column, um, so that these systems can develop and strengthen. Um, surface moisture is another key component and it's overly in abundance in the tropics. Um, the moisture feeds into these inflow of these systems, which then allows for convergence 
of the warm air to uh, rise and gives way to further um, development of the tropical bands and uh, the thunderstorms that develop within these bands. Uh, so storm surge is a result of both tropical cyclones and nor'easters. Um, you know, definitely um, the risk is equally significant with both of these storms, but of course it ultimately depends on the strength of the system and nor'easters themselves can be quite strong too. Um, so just because it's not a tropical cyclone does not mean that this is a, a concern that should be downplayed um, even in the presence of a nor'easter across the mid-Atlantic or northeastern U.S. states. Um, storm surge is, is elevated and enhanced in situations where the timing of a system coincides with the high tide over a given location. Um, but it's also important to evaluate the track of the system to determine where the storm surge risk is going to be most significant. And I'll use Cape Cod as an example here. Um, when you have a system passing to the south of Cape Cod, you're going to have northeasterly winds affecting the Cape. So that would mean with the winds offshore of southern facing beaches, say for around Hyannis or, uh, or Dennis, um, those, be those beaches are going to be less exposed um, to, uh, to storm surge concerns. Um, however, north facing shores north of Provincetown and into uh, the Bay of uh, Cape Cod are going to be more at risk in this example. Um, if a system were to pass west of Cape Cod, southerly onshore winds would increase the risk of storm surge in places like Hyannis. Um, and decrease the risk uh, along northern facing shores of the Cape Cod Bay. So ultimately, the track of the system determines where the um, storm surge risk is greatest, but certainly you have to evaluate where the high tide um, is going to be occurring and what at, at what time that's going to happen, um, because when high tide is expected to coincide with the passage of these systems, storm surge risk is uh, locally enhanced and is certainly a more significant concern. Another factor that influences tides, which is less significant than tropical cyclones and nor'easters, is the moon. <laughs> uh, the moon itself is uh, is actually quite um, influential on the tides. Um, even though the mass of the moon is about one one hundredth of that of Earth, um, it causes a pull on the Earth's oceans and land. Um, you know, we wouldn't be able to identify the pull of the moon on our surface. Um, because it's so um, negligible to the um, in reality to the size of the earth, you wouldn't be able to identify it unless you had a specific tool that could uh, pick up on this uh, occurrence. Um, but you can see it when you go to the beach and you see the waves are larger during the high tide. Um, it is known as a tidal force when the moon is pulling on the um, earth's oceans, causing uh, the uh, influence of the high tide. Um, a tidal cycle between high tide and low tide can, uh, takes a full 24 hours, and there will be two high tides over the course of that window and two low tides over the course of that window. Um, the gravitational pull of the sun can also affect the tides, uh, but it's less significant than that of the moon, um, given the greater distance between the Earth and the sun. Um, certainly, a closer proximity to the sun would result in a greater influence of that, given the, the mass um, of, of the sun uh, versus the moon. Um, so coastal flooding, it's affected by storm surge um, when you have uh, strong winds uh, shoving those uh, waters onshore. Um, high tide flooding can also occur, um, especially in flood pl prone regions. Um, one example of this, for example, is uh, Annapolis, Maryland, which is subject to high tide flooding um, in tidal phases. Um, that can occur at given times um, of day, um, depending on the timing of the high tide. Um, tsunamis can also affect coastal flooding, especially when, when the high tide is in place. Um, of course, a tsunami would need to be generated by an earthquake. So this phenomenon is the less common of the three um, that, are, um, that would occur in such a situation. Um, now for a discussion on tools that are used for forecasting. Um, there are many tools at our disposal um, that we need to take into consideration um, when constructing an accurate forecast. And, um, you know, I'll certainly go into more details about uh, weather models, which I know I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, as far as what we use to construct a forecast, uh, we look at real-time weather data, um, and that includes 
um, looking at visible satellite imagery or even infrared satellite imagery. And you'll see the image on the left is an example of visible satellite imagery, um, which allows you to really see the finer details of cloud cover. Um, it's really good to use um, to get uh, an idea of what thunderstorms might look like as they evolve and strengthen. Um, you can see the tops of the clouds in greater detail in that regard. The downside of visible satellite imagery, however, you're only limited by daylight hours. Um, you can only use this um, satellite imagery during the daytime. Um, it is, uh, unfortunately, it can't be used after dark because um, visible satellite imagery is, uh, is largely influenced by sunlight. Um, now on the right here, you'll see infrared, infrared imagery, um, which can be used to measure uh, cloud tops and the temperatures of the cloud tops. And because we know that temperature decreases with, top, with height, uh, we can infer that in the vast majority of situations that cloud temperature is also going to decrease with height. So the taller the cloud tops, the brighter the colors you're going to see on infrared satellite imagery. Um, and that can also be a good indicator for thunderstorm development. Um, now, there is no limitation for the time of day that you can use infrared satellite imagery. This can be used at any point, unlike visible satellite imagery, but the resolution is not as, um, is not as exceptional with infrared satellite imagery as it is with visible satellite imagery when you can really zoom in on the details. Other tools that we use for forecasting include upper level um, charts, which give you an idea of winds in the upper levels of the atmosphere. Um, in this example, you can see that the jet stream is plotted up um, and it's digging quite far south into um, you know, the Southern Plains and Northern Mexico. And you'll recall from my earlier discussion about what feels nor'easters, um, vertical motion is most enhanced um, in the trough leading up to the downstream ridge. So when you have that vertical motion, you're going to have storm development. And in this example, you'll see that storm development uh, is most likely to occur over the southern and central high plains um, because it's within the trough and ahead of the downstream ridge. Um, so we, we look at the upper level surface analyses or upper level plots, I should say. Um, to get an idea of where a system may develop and how the jet stream is um, shaping up as well, which can give you a better idea of the ultra overall trajectory of a developing system if it were to develop. Other tools we use include real live time um, observations in a given location. Um, one example is uh, the National Buoy Data Center, which can give you an idea of where winds um, and seas are of greatest concern. And when you look at multiple observations over a given location, it can really give you an idea of exactly what is occurring in a given location. Um, so having multiple uh, observations is really important to piecing together a forecast um, and understanding what the nowcast, um, in other words, what's happening in the present moment um, is, is, is going on in a given location. Um, and you can see on the image on the right, you can also look at other types of information such as uh, wind speed and, um, and wind gusts. Um, I have an example plotted up here over the Cape and Islands, as well as southeastern Massachusetts. So it's always good to look at real live data um, to get an idea of what the weather is doing in the present moment. Um, certainly weather models are a tool in the forecasting kit um, that can be used. But certainly there are drawbacks to models uh, because they may not initialize properly. And, but what I mean by initialization is it won't take into consideration conditions um, that were in place at the time that the uh, model run began. Um, so if it does not initialize correctly, um, onward dates and times um, in, the, in the model sequence will not allow for a more accurate reading on what we would expect in the coming hours and even days. So always it's good to hone in on what's happening in the present moment and the models are merely a tool uh, or one of the tools in the forecasting kit that the uh, meteorologists will use to construct uh, that accurate forecast for you. And I have included a couple of examples here um, from our seaweather.net website of a high resolution model and, a European, and the European model uh, showing a nor'easter that's gonna be zipping northeastward um, and passing south of the Cape and Islands towards uh, Nova Scotia and the Canadian Maritimes. Um, so we are a company, as I said, of over 50 meteorologists on staff. 
Um, we never close. We're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, 365 days a year. And we work closely with our clients um, to ensure that they're getting not only the best forecast, uh, but the best route to get from point A to point B. Um, and see weather is one of our supplemental sites. Um, so anyone who uh, drops a question into us at any given time, day or night over the phone or an email, will be there ready to assist you. To assist you. Um, and in the meantime, I'll go ahead and open up the floor to any questions that uh, you may have. Uh, Alex, there's one in the chat. Um, what do you recommend is the best web website slash app to monitor current and future weather? <laughs> Well, I mean, certainly there are an abundance of websites out there. Um, you know, certainly we do offer a um, an, uh, a website and an app, uh, seaweather.net, that allows um, clients to, uh, or anyone um, who wishes to, uh, to um, get involved with it, um, the opportunity to review um, future weather. Um, you know, certainly there are other apps such as Windy and Predict Wind um, that can be used um, and um, certainly are at the disposal of anyone who is uh, looking for, um, you know, weather information, if that makes sense. Alex, I have uh, sort of a comment, sort of a question. Um, I've noticed mm -hmm. in certain narrow waterways, when there's a uh, storm passage, you, you can end up with the opposite problem that all the water um, gets either sucked or blown out of the place and suddenly there's no water in there. Right. And I've never seen any much in the way of predictions of that or warnings about that or any, is there any kind of information about that out there <laughs> when that's likely to happen? You know, that that's a really good question. Um, you know, certainly one of the reasons why that can happen is when you have narrow waterways, you can get the channeling of the water. So when you get the onshore wind, it can really you know, shove the water into those narrow channels, but the opposite can happen when the wind is offshore, which basically channels the water out of the channel and into open waters. Um, I think that would ultimately come down to local um, officials um, that would need to make um, individuals aware who might be affected by that. Um, as far as um, uh, information about where to find that, I don't know that exactly um, who would provide that uh, but I know that's certainly something that local officials um, who monitor ports um, and, and um, waterway entries would have to be uh, keenly aware of in such a situation. Yeah, I've been caught by surprise a couple of times with, uh, you know, down in the Carolinas, like on the intercoastal waterway where there's lots of winding waterways and, and it's, it you know, you can be in a creek that all of a sudden it becomes a dry creek <laughs> you know? right it's it's really quite impressive um that was one place i was in a marina and actually i think we lost eight feet of water and the entire marina went aground for um a, an hour or so <laughs> at low tide and it was interesting right yeah i mean certainly the um you know I, i'm assuming that was near beaufort moorhead city um, you know, certainly you can get that channeling of the water um, in that location. And it certainly is very windy trying to navigate into and out of port. Um, so certainly that can that can pose some challenges. Here in um, Vineyard Haven, you know, we get um, a fair bit of water blowing in from the northeast at times, um, even though we're you know, protected somewhat by Cape Cod, but, um, you know, here in Lagoon Pond, for example, where we have our boathouse, um, once in a while, we'll get an extra three or four feet of water. Um, we had one this winter that washed a bunch of uh, boats, dinghies up into the weeds that were left there and few probably washed away too. <laughs> mm. All right. Yeah, I mean, certainly when you get a nor'easter passing to the south, you can get that protection from the Cape in some senses, especially in Martha's Vineyard, where there's a bit more uh, lee protection from Vineyard Sound in the Cape than, say, in Nantucket. Um, but um, yeah, certainly, um, you know, that's that's a concern. John, um, excuse me, Alex, there's another yes. question. Um, how up to date are current published FEMA flood maps? Hmm. You know that that is a a, a really um, a really good question. Uh, I would think that they update them um, based on previous events, um, as far as you know, understanding the vulnerability of flooding um, in a given location. Um, I would have to check exactly see 
to exactly see how often they update. But I would think that um, whenever there's a flooding situation that has occurred um, in a given location that they would be able to update that from previous events. I had a question for you uh, along the same lines of these channel ways and open shoreline. So if you've got a storm surge and you've got it coming in from whichever direction, uh, you, you pick it, but is it fair to think that the harbor is going to be influenced by the fact that it's channeling the water into a funnel, if you will? So the surge would be higher there than it would be on the south shore, say, of the vineyard, because it's just a monolithic plane over there, if you will. Yeah, you know, funneling can really... Um, can really locally enhance the effects. Um, we see this not only with, you know, with winds, for example, wrapping around capes that can really enhance them, but we can definitely see that with, with surges. Um, and one of the concerns with that is, you know, you obviously have the strong winds pushing the water closer to the coast. And when you have it wrapping around, um, you know, around a port, for example, and into one of these channels, uh, certainly the, the wraparound and funneling can certainly enhance that. And, um, you know, it can it can cause more worse effects than in, than intended. So, can we dig in that a little bit further. You know, is when we're talking about the storm surges, it seems like we're talking more about a surge that's happening at a at a city or at a harbor. And with that said, is it again fair to say that in most circumstances we're just not going to see those surge predictions that they're putting at these harbors on the south coast of the vineyard? I'm so sorry, Adam. Would you <laughs> would you mind uh, repeating that question, please? <laughs> yeah. So we're always hearing, you know, surge forecasts that are that are at cities or in harbors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, main main areas that are in most cases, have this funnel effect. And we're talking about the storm surge there in, in most cases. So we're, we're all hearing, you know, what that number might be. It's a six foot, it's an eight foot surge. But it, it feels like it's it's potentially not going to be the same at a, a long stretch of beach that's just A, facing south and is not funneling in this the surge that's coming in is it is it fair to make that assumption yeah i mean certainly <clears throat> you know it's it's going to be greatest um i mean you're still going to get the water um pushing up to the coast and it, it comes down to how strong the wind is pushing it on shore um but it's certainly i think it would be more uniform in such a situation if that makes sense um i don't think that there would be as much variation um, along a straight line of coast, as opposed to if you had some coast and then um, a waterway that causes funneling, I think there would be more variation for that. Does that make sense? So yeah. like- I Maybe I didn't explain it well. That's that's kind of what I'm saying. Yeah, just right. pick that southerly coastline and then mm -hmm. you have an inlet and that's where the main surge, if you will, or influence of tidal rise that you're really right. going to see so that that's what i'm kind of making sure that there's some confidence in in the discussion right that makes sense yeah yeah i mean certainly it it's going to be less open to variation or there's going to be less variation um you know along a longer stretch of coast and one of the ways that it could be different in such a situation is depending on the strength of the winds if it's the winds are stronger in one location versus another the, the water being pushed on shore could vary in that regard, but it's not as likely to be caused by funneling as just merely the strength of the winds. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, it's, it? it's gonna be both. I, again, it, it's kind of spawning from, okay, you know, Boston, we're gonna see eight feet, but on the South shore, it's probably gonna be less. Right. Okay. There's another question in the chat. How flood prone is Martha's Vineyard? It seems only a couple of feet of storm surge is enough to fully flood major road sections like Five Corners. Don't know if you know that 
locally. It's just down the road here uh, in the middle of Vineyard Haven, but uh, Alex, it's a, it's a major intersection and it floods frequently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, certainly whenever you have, um, you know, it's gonna be more vulnerable to surge when uh, you have an onshore wind. Um, Vineyard Haven itself, uh, which is on the northeastern side of Martha's Vineyard, um, is going to be more susceptible to that um, in that bay, um, you know, funneling in when you get those northeasterly winds funneling into that bay. Um, that's when I think the, the greatest risk um, for surge would occur outside of uh, heavy rain concerns, obviously. Um, but, um, you know, certainly... Um, it's not very far above sea level either, um, which can contribute to um, to flooding concerns. Um, so I think that certainly plays a role in it too. Okay, I don't know if we have any other questions, last minute questions. <laughs> All right, well, thanks, Alex, um, um, for the interesting talk. And um, again, uh, Weather Routing will be our weather sponsor this summer at the Vineyard Cup um, in early July. Please uh, come and join us, uh, sign up for the races, and we'd love to have you. And, and also, uh, don't forget to sign up those kids for summer programs. Uh, they're filling fast. Um, we'll make a recording uh, later. It won't be up tonight, but um, I'll try to get it up sh shortly for those who want to review. And uh, thank you for coming. This is Sail Martha's Vineyard ending the talk. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.